This morning we come to this glorious, glorious statement, Jesus Christ, Lord of all. Jesus Christ, Lord of all. Indeed, we've been studying the box on your page, or not the box, but the passage in the box on the page. Notice there with me, this is the beginning of Philippians chapter 2, and the Apostle Paul is blazing along in this letter to a church that desperately needs encouragement and help. They need guidance. If you're new to us this morning especially, notice the background and context. And all of us can kind of look at this and follow along. I left most of these filled in a little bit at the beginning. Number one, the Apostle Paul writes from where? Prison in Rome. So he's under hardship. And he's writing to the church at Philippi. Now, I've not put this here, but the church at Philippi is also struggling. They have their own persecution and their own issues. Look at number two. He calls them to live as citizens of heaven, even though they are in an earthly realm. He calls them to live as citizens of heaven instead of li living merely as citizens of an earthly realm. You see that in chapter one. Number three, he de deals with the pain of their persecution and also the problem of their disunity. Their disunity comes up in the letter. So there's problems from the outside, their persecution, but there's also some problems on the inside. You know, there's no church that is perfect. Every church has various issues and struggles. One of the greatest struggles that a church can have is a problem with unity. Many of you grew up where somewhere along the way you saw disunity in a church. In fact, some of you left the church for many years because of trouble that you saw as a child or as a young adult or your parents left because of trouble. There was a hardship, there was a clash of personalities, there was disagreement um, over decisions, or there was, just, there was just sinful selfishness that was coming out. Instead of being Christ-like, we were worldly in that, and in that ca case, there are some who are turned away from Christ. It's interesting that what can be our greatest witness can also be one of our greatest turnoffs of people to the gospel. I've told you about the church in Arkansas that um, I used to drive by all the time when I lived there. And the church had asphalt shingles that were green on one side and that were gray on the other side. And every time you looked at that church from the outside, you were reminded of the story of the fact that the church couldn't agree on what color the asphalt shingles should be. And so it was a constant billboard to the community that this is a church that is so divided they can't even have the same color shingles on both sides of the roof. Now we find that slightly humorous, um, but it's really pathetic. And it's a message to the world that the great unifier um, is impotent to unify the congregation. Now, that's not a problem with God. That's a problem with us. And so, we want to see that they had a problem with unity. Number four, notice this. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, which is, this is the fourth message on this box of Scripture. So, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11 may be considered the climax of the letter, and here it is. It is our model for unity. If there's any hope for having unity, we have a picture that is given to us. Now, the interesting thing is, is that the picture that is given to us is the picture of Jesus Christ and what he did and what God did, God the Father did, in exalting him because of what he did. And this is the model, this is the picture for how a church is to draw uh, upon God for its unity. And so, notice this, the golden key to right relationships, let's say these things out loud together, these three things. The golden key to right relationships are Christ's example, his work, and his power. So, we have the example of Christ, the model of his of life, his working in us and his working in the circumstance. We see his going to the cross, 
going to the grave, coming out of the tomb. So it's Christ's work both at Calvary and in us and His resurrection power. Because of this, we can have right relationships. Look at the next part. Verses 5 through 11, so notice that. It's not all the way up there at the top, but verses 5 through 11 is often called the hymn of Christ, H-Y-M-N, the hymn of Christ, the song of Christ. It's poetic. In fact, if you have an ESV Bible, it divides it out and puts it into poetic form. Some Bibles do that, some Bibles don't. But notice there that it breaks from Paul's letter, and he's either quoting this song or he's writing this song. We're not sure um, which one of those it was, whether he was quoting a hymn that they would remember about Christ or whether he himself breaks into a song or a poetic narrative here of what Christ has done. And the key to this, the humility that we see in verses 5 through 8, is the key to their unity. So, um, notice up here how I've put the brackets out here to the side, because I want this to be so clear before we read the text. The first section, he's saying, be united. Don't be what? Now, folks, it is on your outline. Look at it. It's the thing out to the right, okay, of the, the first bracket up there, that first paragraph. He's saying, he's saying be united, don't be divided. Don't be divided. We see that. Let's read that. So if there's any, verse 1, so if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and any sympathy, he said, if there's anything about you that's Christian, verse 2, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. Verse 3, do nothing from what? Selfish Selfish ambition or conceit. That's, That's you lifting yourself up over others. You know, that you're in a conceited place. You know, very conceited. You, you, you're, you're really lifting yourself up, looking down on others. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But look, circle this, but in what? Humility. humility, there's the key word, in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each one of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And here in this, we start to see, verses 1 through 4, we are looking at the great call of unification in Christ. How how would your home look different if both husband and wife and children truly allow these verses to begin to saturate their mind and the challenge of these verses to saturate their mind with the picture that God calls us to of not saying me, me, me and living with the me monster, but instead submitting ourselves to one another. And not only in the home, but also in the church, in the world that's around us. Now, We can't do that in ourselves. We're just too selfish. We cannot do this in our own strength. We can't do it just because we need to back off in ourselves. No, we have to look to a power that's greater than our selfishness. We have to look to the one who is greater than all of our sinfulness. You see, what we've been told to do is to act like God, and we can't act like God without God. And so here's verse, that many, many people try to do that. Many people try to be like God. They try to be a good Christian, a better person, without recognizing the absolute poverty, poverty that we have in ourselves. Once we come to see the riches of Christ and all that he did and all that he gives, we can be this thing that we see at the top. So look at the next bracket. We see, so be united, don't be divided, and here's how to do that. He's saying, since you have Christ, think and act like him. And we see this in verse 5. 
Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be held onto or grasped. You see, this is before he became a man. This is before he became in human flesh. Have this mind. Jesus, he did not count all those things to be held onto in verse 7, but he emptied himself. Taking by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Verse 8, and being found in human form, not only to become a man, look what it says, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So we see, and we've studied that for the last couple of weeks, now we come to verse 9. We see what happens as a result of him becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Look at verse 9. Circle the first word of verse 9. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, verse 11, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father, to the glory of God the Father. Look at the statement out there to the right. You see, after we look at the humility of Christ, we see that God exalts the humble son to Lord of all. So he who was willing to become the lowest and the lowest through taking the sin of the world upon himself, he is raised to be the highest. And so in this we see much about God. We see the humility of God, but yet we also see the power of God. And this is the glorious nature of this text. Now, very often we've only focused on verses 5 through 11, ignoring its context. The context is what? Be unified. Be like Christ to each other. Show the world what Christians really look like. But we we can't do that with ourselves, so we look to Christ and we see the great and glorious work of Christ. Now, the reason that we often focus on verses 9 through, or excuse me, 5 through 11, this statement about Christ, is because it is the key to everything. We just don't want to miss that it's a key that was given in the context of a problem with church unity. So, let's look at this. Humility is the key to unity. And we also see that humility is the key to exaltation, like a master or a submaster key. What do I mean by that? Well, just on this property, we have 88 outside doors. Does that sound crazy or what? And that's just the outside doors. That doesn't even include the doors that come inside and that still have to be locked. And so we have, we have people that go around uh, that live on campus, and it's part of their job to go all the way around the campus every evening and in the middle of the night and in the early mornings, and they keep this place locked down because we want it to be very, very safe for kids when, they, when the 500 kids get here for each morning to school or for church. And so we have all these different keys but what's amazing is, is that we don't, they're not all the same levels. So there's some keys that are higher than others. And so we, we start to call some of them master keys. It's a submaster. It's not the master master key. But let me just show you here that when we start to see this, that humility is a key to exaltation, we start to see that we, we see this, this great key that opens all of the doors is the exaltation of Christ. The the key that brings people together, it also is like a, a master key. A key that brings people together is humility. So when we are humble, we can be brought together. One of the keys that brings all of the glory of God to the earth is the humility of God. 
And we have to see that this comes with great glory. All these passages that I've put down here below this, Matthew 23, Luke 14, James 4.10, 1 Peter 5, I want to encourage you to, to study those passages and look at them again as you, as you just kind of think through this thing that if you want to be exalted, if there's any hope of there being the glory of exaltation, it comes first through tr true humility. You see, there's no other passage other than Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11 that shows clearly, more clearly shows us this. Fill these in. We see the depth of Christ's condescension. And I want you to think about that. We see the depth of Christ's condescension. He comes down. He condescends to us. Now, very often you're used to the word condescension being a negative word. You say, don't speak to me in a condescending way. You ever said that before to somebody? Well, when do you say that? You, you know, somebody may feel that way when somebody goes, oh, like I'm going to do what you did, right? And, and, and you, you feel like you're, you're being talked down to. Well, before you get so offended that somebody talked down to you, you need to recognize that the King of kings and the Lord of lords came down to you. And not only did he come down to join us, he took all of our sins upon himself. And he took to them, lifted up to the place of humiliation. So he's lifted up above there so everybody can look and see and ridicule. This is God. This is the one who spoke all things into existence, allows himself to be nailed to a trust. He lays down his life. His life was not taken from him. He laid it down. Jesus said, no one takes my life. I will lay it down and I will take it up again. And that's exactly what he did. So we see that humility is the key to unity. It's the key to exaltation. We see this through the condescension of Christ, that he shows us what true humility looks like. And then we see in this passage, the part that we see this morning, verses 9 through 11, we see the height of Christ's exaltation. So, you know, God is a God of ultimates. He is ultimately powerful. He is ultimately wrathful. He is ultimately holy. He is ultimately gracious. He is ultimately loving. And he's ultimately perfect in the way he does what he does. And so, when there is ultimate humility, he exalts that. And that's what he does with Christ. Don't turn your sheet over. Are you kidding me? Oh, look at Hebrews 12. Look at Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. How could we miss this? And, and Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2, strangely mirrors Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. See if you don't see that. You know, 5 through 8 is the humility. 9 is the exaltation. Look at Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which, so, which clings so closely. He's saying, you know, we have people that are watching. There's people that are all around us watching. Don't hold on to your stupid sin. They're looking at you. Let go of your sin. See, this is very similar. Don't hold on to your disunity, Philippians. Let go of your disunity. And here we see the same idea. And let us run with, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And how do we find the strength to do that? Verse 2, same idea. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Read out loud with me the underlined portion. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Do you see the condescension in this? Look at the condescension. He endured the cross, despising the shame. Look at the exaltation. Look at the end. And is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, the call is for you and for me to look to Christ, and by looking to Christ, we lay down our sin. I can't just be a better Christian. 
I cannot do this in my strength. If I say, I gotta do better, I gotta do better, I gotta do better, my friends, I'm going to surely fail. But when I look at Jesus, the one who gave it all for me, the one who took all of my sin upon himself, that when I really consider what he has done and I cast my belief and my hope upon the cross and I see how much he loved me, my friends, that changes my motivations. You see, you can't just seek to do it to be a better Christian, to look better. No, friends, we look to Jesus and we start to say, if he did that for me, oh, how I might live for him. Friends, this is what we see. We always have to look to Jesus for our strength. We always have to look to Jesus and what he has done, the statement of his love on the cross for us, that by being so loved, we may love him. You see, in 1 John, it says that we love because he first loved us. We didn't love him first. He loved us first. And when we really start to camp out on his love, we really start to let the truth and the reality of his love flow over our lives. We start to read his word and see how from beginning to end, it is saying, I love you. You have, I created you in love. You have turned and rebelled against me in your, in your fallenness. But listen to this. I've made a plan to redeem you, creation, fall, redemption, and I'm going to make you back right, completely holy. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. This is the message of the Bible. And it's, it's very, it's very, very knowable. That's why God has given it to us. I'm so proud of you for being here. Some of you have been coming, you've been coming, and you've been listening, and you've been hearing the picture and the story of the Bible. You've been hearing, and things are starting to fit together for you. I just want to say, I'm, I'm so hopeful for you that you would allow God's Word to come into your life and change you, and that the reality of His Spirit and His Word in you would help you see that you can believe upon Him and you can turn to him. Well, in these verses, 9 through 11, it is safe to turn it over now. Look at four aspects of the Father's exaltation of the Son. There are four things in what we study this morning. We're going to go through them very quickly. I want you to see them. I think they're very clear. Um, The first one is this. We see the source of the exaltation. The source of the exaltation, circle it up there in verse 9, is God. Therefore, God. It is God who does what? He does what? It's right there in the next part. He does what? He highly exalts him. Jesus is exalted. The Son is exalted by the Father. And why is he exalted? Because he went to the obedient place of not only becoming a man, but going it and taking it all the way to the grave. You see, therefore God has highly exalted him. I want want us to look at this. There's four ways in which God has exalted him. The source of this has exalted him. First of all, we see it in Jesus' resurrection. So on the cross, he is taken from the cross in death when he says, it is finished or paid in full, and he is laid in a tomb. And when the Father, gloriously through his plan, sees the Son's obedience, and this is all part of his plan from the foundation of the world, he resurrects the Son. He resurrects the second person of the Trinity in his power. Mark chapter 16, notice the the passage that's in front of you. It's on the screen. It's not on your outline. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. But what? He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. So we see the the basic resurrection of Christ. In Acts chapter 2, verse 31 through 33, look what it says. David spoke about, this is Peter preaching at Pentecost. David spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his body see decay. Verse 32, God has raised this Jesus to life, to which we are all witnesses. Look what it says in verse 33. 
exalted then to the right hand of God, and he has received from the, from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you see in here. So what happens? God exalts the Son and receives from the Father the, and Jesus receives from the Father this glorious position. Look at Paul's opening to the whole book of, the, of Romans. The whole book of Romans starts off like this. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, look at the next part, who was descended from David according to the flesh. You see, this is his coming down in his humility. And then in verse 4, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of, of holiness by what? His resurrection from the dead. This is how you know this Jesus is God. He is resurrected from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Not only do we see this in the resurrection, but we also see this in his ascension. That Jesus wasn't only raised from the dead, but he was taken back into heaven. In John 20, 17, Jesus says, don't cling to me. I've not, I've not yet returned to the Father. He says that at his resurrection, but we see that it's coming. And I want you to notice Acts chapter 1, verse 9 and verse 11. We see the, this beautiful picture of the ascension. Right at the beginning of the book of Acts, we see that Jesus is taken back into heaven. Look at verse 9. And this is on your outlet, or excuse me, on the screen. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, what does it say? He was lifted up. It didn't say he flew up himself. But it says he was lifted up. This is the Father's work in all of this. He was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. In verse 11, men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, whom has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So this is the beautiful picture. This is part of the Father's good plan and the Father's work and the Father's power that he is exalting Christ. He raises him from the dead because of his obedience unto death. And then he takes him back into, out of the incarnation, back into heaven. And this is a glorious picture of God's great work of exalting his Son. And not only the resurrection and the ascension, but fill it in, the coronation, the coronation. This is the picture of crowning him as king. And we could go on and on and on on this one. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus says it himself, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Who gave him that authority? God the Father. Now, we want, to be, we want to be so careful, as we're going to unpack here a little bit, we want to be so careful to understand that within the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit are completely equal. They are complete, completely pure in their relationship to one another. And there's this, there's this glorious equality and this glorious beauty in their being one. But as we look at that, we start to see the essence and the nature of God in Father, Son, and Spirit, and it starts to show us things about God, like His humility that He would come to the earth, like His power that He is raised from the dead, like His love that He would lay down His life for His people. You see, there are things that we start to see from the Trinity that would be very difficult perhaps for us to see about God had He not been in this way, but this is the way He is. This is His essence. Look at the next part. Not only is He coronated as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, but notice this, He is the high priest. And I love this. He is the one true high priest between God and man. It is Jesus Christ. He is the one who says that, that before the world began that he would come and intercede for his people, that he is able to save completely those who draw near to him. And he always, listen to this, Romans it says, he always lives to intercede for us. Another passage that we, that we see there is flip, or Psalm 2 in Psalm 89. Excuse me, Hebrews chapter 7, and then look there all the way across that line. These would be great passages in Hebrews for you to go look up. And why? Because they describe the nature of Jesus interceding for his people. 
He is the high priest. So all of this comes as the source of the Father. Number two, the title. What title do we see him given in verse 9 and 10? Um, Look what it says. And he bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Now, first of all, the word bestowed means to generously give. It is generously given. You know, when you talk about, oh, wow, he bestowed something. You don't use that term very often, do you? Oh, yeah, I went down to the parts store, and I bought the parts, and uh, the guy behind the desk bestowed upon me some new coupons. You, You don't say that. But we think about bestowal when it comes to something that a father is giving to his children, like an inheritance or like a big formal gift. And so here we begin to see this, that in verse 9, look what it says, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Now, this is, a, this is a strange thing that we see through the Scripture, but it, it's almost as if the position and the work of Jesus, the essence of Jesus, is greater after His death and resurrection than it was before, that there is more authority given to Him, that there is more prominence given to Him. In a sense, that's very true. If you read the Scripture, though they are completely equal in their power and their might and their purity and all of those things, we see that this great act that the Father had planned before all of creation, that God Himself had planned throughout all the creation, we see that this exalts the Son, and it is a name that is given among Him. Now, um, I I also want you to notice here the name we put out there to the side title, because we're not merely talking about the name of Jesus. We we would often say, well, this passage is always talking about Yeshua, that Yahweh saves, Jehovah saves. And I would say, well, yes, it's talking about the name Jesus, but and so much more. Because it's not merely the name. There's many people that are named Jesus. You know, it wasn't until I met people here in Miami um, that are Hispanic that, that, you know, we have a bunch of Jesuses running around. <laughs> Jesus. As a kid growing up, I wasn't used to that. As I got to know somebody, I, you know, they would say his name is Jesus, and I'm like, great. And then I would see it written, and I'm like, Mom, that says Jesus. <laughs> Anybody ever experienced that before? Okay, all of us non-Hispanics are experiencing that right now. I love it. But we, we, wh- wh- what does the name Jesus mean? It means Jehovah saves. That's beautiful. It's Joshua. Yeah, yeah, now that's the other thing. The name Joshua is the same name from Hebrew. So if your name is Joshua, that's the, that's the picture of Jehovah saves. Now, the, while there would be many that are named Jesus, there's not many that are named Lord. And so when we start to see the picture here, it is, it is not just the name of Jesus, but it's the name of Jesus as Lord of all, as Lord of all things. It's the title that is given here. And we see that it's very clear. It's not, there's, no, there, there's no ambiguity about it. Notice what it says in verse 9 and 10. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name. Doesn't stop right there. Keeps going with the description. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ, what does it say? Is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so we we need to start to recognize that this idea of Lord is saying, this is Yahweh God. This is the I am. And so fill this in. This is declaring Jesus' deity. What do we mean by deity? Those of you who are new to church or new to Bible study, deity is talking about this is his godness. This is the fact that he's God. You see, we don't believe that Jesus was just a nice prophet 2,000 years ago, a good moral leader. We believe that Jesus came and Jesus was God in the flesh and that he was God in the flesh that would lay down his life for sinners. 
I, a few years ago, spoke with a man here in town. He said, oh, you go to Sheridan Hills. And I said, yeah, I go. Y'all come sometime. And he said, I, I might. And I uh, didn't tell him who I was, but we were, we were talking a little bit. And he said, you know, I'm kind of into churches right up into the point where they start saying Jesus is God. And then I'm out of there. I said, wow. And to be honest with you, I don't remember what all I said to him. I'll guarantee you I said some things to him, lovingly, gently, but I, a wonderful opportunity for us to say, well, wait a minute, if Jesus wasn't God, then who was he? And what does it matter? What would it matter if we nailed another man to the tree? But the fact that he rose again from the dead and he said, your sins are forgiven. And if you come to me, I will give you rest. You see, this is God. And this is Lord of all. So what is the main emphasis of this title? The main emphasis of this title is that Jesus is being declared and recognized as Lord of all. He is God of all things. So the source, the title that is here. And we see that number three really backs up the whole title issue. Look at number three, the response. What is going to be the response to the fact that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father? Look what it says in verse 10. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, this is right under number three there, and at verse 11, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. There's three groups that are talked about. I've left all of the answers here so you can just follow along very quickly. Look what it says. There's three groups, and you see them from verse 10. In heaven and on earth and under the earth. So in heaven, these are redeemed believers and holy angels. That's the only ones that are in heaven. On earth, this is talking about the redeemed and the unredeemed people that are on the earth here. But what about under the earth? This is talking about the unredeemed dead and the fallen angels awaiting God's judgment. And what this is saying is that everyone everywhere is going to recognize and declare Jesus, Yeshua, the Christ as Lord of all. So there are two responses for everyone everywhere. And the, the, we first see this is, is that their knees are going to bow. And notice what it says, every knee is going to bow. Um, you know, if a team is getting together and they say, hey guys, come on over here, everybody take a knee. You know, the idea is, you know, that first came from, not from Kaepernick, but that first came from a team coming together to whatever. But then we've, we, you know, we have... Uh, a movement where we hear about taking a knee. And very often it looks like this. Nothing wrong with that. It's great um, to, to use that phrase. But I want you to see that this is saying every knee is going to bow. Every knee is going to bow. You see, this is the position of a defeated foe. Jesus didn't just bow. Jesus went all the way to death and was laid in a tomb so that we might not have to go all the way to death and be lost forever in our sin. But if we come and we bow before him recognizing that he is king and we are not, we come before him in humility. This is the picture. Now, there's many people who want Jesus to be Lord, um, excuse me, there's many people who want Jesus to be Savior without him being Lord. Oh, I like the idea of Jesus dying on the cross for my sins. That's wonderful. And that he loved me before I love him. That's wonderful. But here we see that if he is not Lord of our lives, then he is not the Savior of our lives. This is very important. We bow on knees. We confess as Lord. This is the picture that all in, crea all in creation are going to do. Now, verses 9 and 10 are directly linked to a prophecy from Isaiah 45, and I absolutely love this. I've put it in a gray box because it's very important. I want you to see this. 
Look at Isaiah 45, verses 22, verse 23. Tell me if this doesn't sound similar. Turn to me and be saved. You see, this is God. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. Do you see the emphasis on deity? Look at this, verse 23. By myself I have sworn, because he can't swear to anyone higher, he is the highest. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. Look what it says. To me every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall swear allegiance. You see, friends, this is the picture of God's glory and his supremacy over all things. Uh, and this, this is nothing but encouraging to the true Christian. Not only will this recognition save you, but this recognition will empower you to recognize that Jesus is Lord over everything. He's Lord over this life. He's Lord over my problems. He's Lord over my pains. He's Lord over my final state. And where I go, he is Lord over all that is around me. Not the Supreme Court, not a president, not a, a, a union of countries. Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father, far above all earthly rule. The Father exalts the Son as Lord of all. Now, why does he do this? This is beautiful. And this is so, if, you, if, if you're studying the Bible, you will see that this is so predictable from God because God is always about his glory. God is always about what will bring glory to him on the earth. Some of you would say, well, that sounds like an egotistical God. Listen, if you can create the whole universe ex nihilo, it's your option. <laughs> and God made the world to bring him glory. And let me tell you, he's made you in love, and he's made you so that he will even share his glory with you, a created being that sinned against him. He will forgive you and redeem you, and listen to this, he will share his glory with you. He's already done that in the common creation around us. We, we have the ability to procreate. We can create. We have the ability to design and build. We have the ability to think and the ability to appreciate beauty and the ability to, to make art, the ability to accomplish work. All of these things are like God. And so he says to me, even in your sin, I will specifically save you if you will come and recognize who I am. And why does he do it? because he's made the universe to glorify him. So look what it says in verse 11. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and for why? To the glory of God the Father, just like the rest of creation. Notice the statement that is under here. Within the Trinity, there is a constant mind-boggling flow of God's glory from and to the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Within the beautiful Holy Trinity, there is glory flowing in, in ways that, that just boggle our minds. How does he do this? I, I cannot explain this. How does a God become fully man and yet retain his Godship? I cannot, I cannot fully explain that, but I know that the Bible has told me that it's true. And so this is part of faith. This is part of coming to believe what he said, what he's preserved for us. And as you start to hear his voice and he's calling you to believe upon him, you see that it's for your good and for his glory. There's so many different passages that we could speak of this, but the picture is, is that this trinity is in perfect unison. They exalt one another perfectly. And we see the Father exalting the Son for our salvation and for his rulership over all things. Oh, friends, I, I want you to recognize as you look at number three, these three groups, in heaven, on earth, under the earth, what is their response? I mean, whether or not, you, you see, here's the, right out there to the side. It's either by choice or by force that 
every being is going to recognize Jesus as Lord. It's either by choice or by force. I want to encourage you today when you hear God's voice calling you to believe upon him and say, I recognize you as Lord. I don't understand everything about that. I don't know what all you're going to ask, what all you may demand, but I cannot escape the fact that this passage says that you loved us so much that you laid down your life. Why would I turn away and refuse by faith to say, you are Lord to the glory of the Father. Friend, I call you to receive this great gift and by choice before it is too late to recognize who he is. The application, number one, ask yourself, everybody in this room, ask yourself, who is Lord of my life. Who is the Lord of my life? Just think about that. You say, oh, Jesus, Jesus became Lord of my life when I was 11. Well, maybe. I'm not talking about decisional evangelism where you walk down an aisle somewhere and you filled out a card or you had an emotional experience. I'm asking you who actively is Lord of your life, really, Lord of your life, who is the authority over your mind and your heart? Who do you submit to? You see, who do I exalt? Here's a question for you. Who do I exalt as king? I want you to imagine yourself standing before a king, and you're in his kingdom. Is that how you view God? Because, my friend, you may not realize it, but you're in his kingdom. Do you recognize him as king? How about this? Ask yourself, who do I serve? Some of you might say, well, if I'm real honest, I serve myself. Well, then that means self is king. Maybe you would say this, if I'm real honest, I serve my, my marriage. If I do any act of service, it's about my marriage. That's what I really believe in. My friends, your marriage can't save you from your sins. You might be a wonderful servant in your, in your marriage, but friends, your marriage can't save you from your sins. Some of you would say, well, it's our family and our kids. We really serve our kids. We're really concerned about our kids. We're into our kids. I'd say that's great, but your family can't save you. There's only one that can save you. For some, it's your boss at work, and my goodness, I know he can't save you, and you know that too. <laughs> your nest egg in your retirement, is that what you nurse? Is that what you take care of? Someday wanting to be able to retire and you're, that's what you're really concerned about. That's what dictates all your decisions. Be careful. And maybe for some it's, you know, how many views do I have? <laughs> One of our school teachers did a dance and as of last night, this was at the Shark Fest, as of last night, it has 1.2 million views. You say, School teacher, Sharon Hills Baptist Church, a dance. Well, yeah, you have to see it. Um, thought we are Baptists. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but, you know, there's some people that just worship the number of views they're going to get. What do other people think? You see, those can be the Lord of your life, the exalted king of your life. That can be what you serve. Or do you think most pointedly about the one who created you and went to the cross for you. See, number two, if Christ is not the Lord of your life, why not? You need to ask yourself that question. If Christ is not my Lord, why not? Why do I refuse to do this? Why do I refuse to recognize him? My friend, I, I want to say to you that there's there's no reason, 
that supersedes the beauty of his love to overcome you. The last question is number three, or statement is number three. We call you to turn to his lordship and trust in his salvation, to recognize that he is the Lord to the glory of the Father. Friend, I plead with you. I plead with you to recognize who he is and what he's done and why he's done it. For the glory of God and your good, don't miss this, don't miss this. Look at Mark chapter 1 and verse 15. Both of these are there. Lordship and salvation are there. Look what Jesus said. Jesus said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. What does it say? Read it out loud. Repent and believe in the gospel. And do you know what gospel means? What that, what that literally means? It means good news. The good news is that God has come. This was the beginning of Jesus' ministry. The good news that was that he was, he's come. He's provided a Messiah. He's provided a sacrifice that we might know the King of kings and the Lord of lords and stand not in fear and condemnation, but stand under the torrent of not only his wrath in ourselves, but listen to this, under the torrent of his love that radically changes our lives. I call upon you today, recognize Jesus as Lord to the glory of the Father. Amen?